Welcome to Show Studio. So our very last panel of the Spring Summer 15 season. Um, but it's obviously a really exciting one because we're going to be talking about all the shows that happened in Paris. And it was an interesting season for lots of different reasons, partly for all the kind of um, HR developments that we saw with all the different designers moving from different different houses and the new appointments, but also just purely for the fashion that was on show. And also, in many cases, also for the comments that the fashion made, um, whether respectfully or disrespectfully, about what's going on in the wider world. So there's lots to talk about. Um, Helpfully, I've got an amazing set of panellists with me from all across the industry who can help dissect the highs and the lows and the odd moments of Paris. Um, but before we start our discussion, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Tim. Uh, Tim Blank, style.com. I'm Alex Fiore, I'm the fashion editor of The Independent. I'm Jessica Bumpus, and I'm fashion features editor at Vogue.co.uk. And I'm Gianluca Longo, freelance journalist and the fashion observer. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to start by asking you guys what you want to talk about. What were, the, what were the highlights? Were there any shows that blew us away and made us feel like this was a great season and a really exciting time for fashion? It's been really awkward if no one says Silence to say. <laughs> um, I, think, I think Paris was, as it always is, a, a, a great um, mix of, of things. It's, there's never a... There's never a a thread in Paris the way there is in other places. So um, I, I don't think it was necessarily a, a, a fantastic season, no. um, but there was, you know, there was a lot to appreciate. And I was quite surprised at how um, designers who I've thought of in in one particular way kind of up their game a little bit. And, Give me and an example. Uh, now you put me on a spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I, I like somebody kind of quiet like Christophe Lemaire, for example. Okay, I, li I like the way he has evolved. I mean, he said goodbye at Hermes. He began the week. Um, his his show was the first show of the week, and then yeah. his last show for Hermes was for the Hermes. last show of the week. So it's rather odd that Christophe Lemaire should be bookending yeah. the week. But no, um, you know, it's just interesting seeing the way somebody like him has come along yeah. um, and and become quite a you know quiet force actually. Yeah. It's interesting, you, you kind of talk about the season and say that you know, it wasn't the strongest season. I'm going to quote you, Alex, in something you wrote that I was interested in when you did your kind of Paris roundup. And it's not nothing too bad, don't worry. I was slightly demented <laughs> with, with illness and hallucination when I did Yeah, I know, I Must loved be, what you wrote about Stella no McCartney. Excuse. It was Must very be pointed poetic. I know, I was, I was um, well when I wrote that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you wrote about this season, this felt like a season in flux, in upheaval, and in times of upheaval. Look, in upheaval. Looking back and steadying yourself in the past is the most obvious thing to do. So mm. I thought that was an interesting thing. Just to expand on that for me, because that's something that's come up a lot during the panels this season and in the roundups we've done so far, this idea of people being vaguely in a state of panic and kind of grasping at straws a little bit and looking at their archives and trying to establish what they're about, sometimes in quite a desperate way, other times in a really clear and sharp way. I don't think it was in, in panic and <coughs> I think that that's probably pulled specifically out of uh, what I wrote about um, Dior mm. and Dior obviously was, was very much themed in the recent past in terms of it referenced his Haute Couture show from July and also I felt it referenced his menswear show which both of, of which were about kind of examining the past and about creating something forward thinking forward looking by using elements from the past and that was very much what what Raf wanted to do with this with sure. this Dior ready to wear show. Um, so when, talk to me about the upheaval you referenced there then. Well, as you said at the start, there's lots of people moving to different houses. Yeah. And also I think, for instance, with Com, I felt, and I'm not sure if you're supposed to say it, but for me, for that, that Com collection coming out of this sort of uncertainty that we're experiencing at the moment, the fact that, you know, it showed on Saturday, war had been declared on Friday, but obviously it was brewed in this sort of crucible mm. of, of tension and of upheaval um, of the political situation in the Middle East. I felt like it w it's a world that's kind of a, a frightening place at the moment. Yeah. And it was interesting to see how designers reacted to that, whether it was looking backwards and looking at a nostalgia or something like Con, which I felt was such a kind of visceral reaction to it, wh mm. which was really, and there was something, I mean, I talked a about it reminding me a little bit of Marie Antoinette and... and as everything does. <laughs> as everything does. As so much does in Paris, because also I think Paris is, is rooted in so much history, specifically fashion. You know, yeah. it goes back to Louis XIV. Um, but... Further back. Well, Louis XIV was the first person that it kind of put it into guilds that only certain people could make certain things. So I always think of that as being kind of 
really the start of modern fashion, even ahead of, of Charles Frederick Worth, but no, but even, even further back, you're right. Um, so I think there's always a lot of history in, in Paris, it's always very aware of yeah. its own history, and specifically its own fashion history. But this, to me, maybe, I don't, it's intriguing to get everyone's opinion, it didn't feel like it was about Paris that much. I think there were the designers who looked at the way the world is, and it felt like they were looking at the world, and then there were the designers that kind of blissfully ignored that and did these kind of fantasy things, and that seemed more about looking at Paris and history and joy. But I, I think it's, it's more about mm. Paris as, you know, when you're in Paris, I was, if, if you go up the Eiffel Tower, you look at, out at Paris and that's basically what it looked like when the Eiffel Tower was built. Mm. You know, there isn't that much contemporary architecture in Paris, it's very much mired in history and, you know, for, with Chanel they built that, that street scene that could have been a street <coughs> scene from the 19th century. There's, sure. there's all that, there is very much this kind mm. of sense of living history in Paris, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, which doesn't necessarily make for, for historical collections. And I, I don't think, this is a very rambling conversation. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but, but no, I feel like there was this, this sense of upheaval. And for me, it's linked with political situation at the moment and the two extremes of reactions to that are Dior, which is looking at the past, and Colm, which was very much about living in that present. And the other extreme is Chanel, which is just about like wrapping that up and selling it back to you. Mm. But do you think um, the, 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 the sort of historical, uh, this, the, the living history element of, of, of France and Paris actually, is, is sliding towards the moribund, that in a museum city, the past is kind of paralysis rather than inspiration? I think it can, a lot of people have talked about the architecture of Paris and how it's actually choking pr by preventing people from building kind of new contemporary buildings. And getting around easily. Yeah, exactly. And which, which you experience all the time when you're there for Fashion Week. Um, but I think the, you know, for instance, the, what I loved with what Raft did was it was about looking at the past, but I really felt like by synthesizing it and by combining all these different elements from different parts of the past it came up with a fusion that felt new and that felt yeah. forward thinking that was interesting for me the idea of using elements from the past and creating something that genuinely felt forward thinking and I think, felt progressive i think with that collection certainly it kind of redefined what we thought as modern because obviously we've had this whole like norm core kind of anodyne i feel like landscape in fashion lately yeah. and because that took the sort of historical elements and we had, you know, even like at Celine, you had those kind of like vintagey references in the dresses. We suddenly had clothes with a bit more personality and character. They weren't sort of that yeah. sci-fi futurism kind of, um, and it, yeah, it just felt like there was more personality and character. And, and particularly with Dior, it sort of made you go, oh, that looks fresh again, when actually it was sort of plundering the past. It was like a mm. really nice new way of packaging it. It's really interesting that you said it, because we've had a couple of discussions um, on these panels about nostalgia and people have made these comments about oh, we should be looking forward but I think there's a, a wonderful irony that when people do try and do stuff that feels quite futuristic and I'd cite Louis Vuitton as an example of this not so much the collection but kind of the show when people try and do stuff that feels very forward thinking it can look a bit old mm. it can look a bit kind of like 70s futuristic but I think that great. I think the clothes were very it, was, it felt to me very retro futuristic it exactly very much like it was you know sort of Logan's run mm. yeah Star Trek. But, but that element that people do remember Jeremy Scott years ago talked about nostalgia for the future when he first mm, started. Yeah. So, mm. um, and the clothes being the product, <coughs> the, the original inspiration for, say, the Vuitton outfits, being the product of a time when idealism was genuine, when there did seem to be alternatives that were going to make the world a better place. Mm. So when you revisit them later in time, with the, the hindsight having slightly sort of curdled your optimism, um, then you have this nostalgia, you, you're, you're kind of looking at that vision of the future in a nostalgic way. Yeah. You're looking at a time when people did think that mm. things could get better. Mm. Mm. And so it's a, it's a kind of, um, I suppose it's a kind of decadence in a way. Mm. Well, it's almost like imagining the present as, the present is the future of the past. So what Wait, we, what go we, <laughs> <laughs> it is. the present it is. is 1984 when you hit yeah. 19, you know, the present is yes. the past's future. So if you look at the past version of the future mm. as the present, that's, you know, it's a very, again, <laughs> I'm, gone. I'm, I'm quite convoluted. But by I this think time. it's something that, I think that the, the Dries van Noten finale yeah. very much that was tapped that, that yeah. when, those, when those women just settled mm. on that carpet like that. It was just, it was and laid out kind of things. unexpected. Mm. And I actually thought it was really, really beautiful. I think it was I rather mean, beautiful. It was, it, mm. it, it summed up a lot of what I'd been 
thinking about anyway. That that there's a sort of, I think there's a recognition now that that it's how, there's a recognition now of how hard it is to improve things. That mm. I do feel that the very end of the Chanel show, I know people were entirely cynical about it, but the way that all came together for me with you know with what is happening in the world with women's rights, that every time there's a step forward for women's rights or gay marriage or anything, there's a counteraction that is that is venomous and that has that has made things like women's rights now things that shouldn't even be shouldn't even be negotiable and now mm. you know points of discussion again and i do feel at the end of the chanel show when the pet shop boys came on with it's all right i think michelle gobert's soundtrack for that <coughs> show was just was genius yeah. best thing and th that song the pet shop boys singing it's all right um, neil tennant's voice the melancholy and that's uh, it's you know it's it's all right it's um it's gonna the music plays for, you know, well, I'm trying to think of the lyrics right now. My mind's gone, my mind's gone completely void. Sing to us. But um, uh, there's a sort of optimism, but a melancholy. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that's what the end of the Chanel show was. I really Can we talk it. about I that Chanel it, show and that project? I mean, to be honest, I think it's, uh, I didn't see all these cynical things, of course. Everyone has been commenting on, you know, the uh, ladies first and, you know, tweet this better than Twitter, whatever. I found it incredibly amusing. Maybe I was the only one in the, in the audience. I love the music. It was a, such an up show. And actually, it was a great Chanel show for the clothes. I mean, for the first time, you know, the colors and the prints were right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was everything there, every paradigm of, uh, um, uh, of a Chanel uh, collection. I think that was actually, that's what I, I concentrated on, you know. Karl Lagerfeld, every season there is a new, a new coup. I mean, even last season, everyone could have criticized the fact of what are doing luxury people doing in a supermarket. I mean, if yeah. you really want to go deep, you just say, what are they doing in, you know, buying choco po Coco Pops or whatever they call it. Yeah. I didn't see all that. I just want to see the clothes, and that's what I, that's what I'm there for. I yeah. mean, of course, I understand all your points of the past, of the present, or whatever. Yeah. But even at the Louis Vuitton, I went. I was so lucky to stay there one more day and to see the clothes the day after. The way they're made and everything is so beautiful that mm. maybe I'm re reducting everything to the clothes themselves but that's yeah. what I like to see <coughs> beautiful made clothes but I think it's different it's difficult with the Chanel show because in some sense I agree actually it was a strong collection in some ways based on the clothes I quite liked some of them but then you can't just analyze it for that when it is presented in this way that's what and I understand why this was seen as so problematic I think it was just kind of I want I, to say it was a bad time, but it wasn't a bad time. It was a deliberate use of time. It was, you know, from the very beginning, if you remember how the show started, I mean, that was so genius, you know, with the, with the girls walking with the handbags of boombox and, you yeah. know, the music and the whole that uh, summing up and, you know, powering up the whole room with the, cl just with, I just wanted the clothes to talk, to be honest. Mm. And then all that, uh, you know, the, the, the pickets at the end, why not, to be honest? I but didn't I see anything, anything wrong and anything too political in there. Maybe but I I'm think the, maybe I'm the only people one in, in the world. Hong Kong are kind of getting. Yeah, I just. Well, that. But, that but, and but then, then what he, messages he, he, there he were? He did I mean. make that point that you know that he did this months ago. So. But then kill you know, it. The, the do you know it? what I mean? Like uh, cut it. I do agree. I don't. I think. If, I, I love think that you look so pained to agree with me. But <laughs> no, I think if it if it's <coughs> really fashion is about the time that it's in and I'm thinking back to which I, I referenced on another panel to September the 11th and how many designers yeah. changed their collections in a reaction to that yeah and how many people got criticized for that and this seems like when people were changing entire collections this just felt like it was and I agree with you I, I really like the collection I absolutely love the collection mm -hmm. but I hated the ending and for me I had a big debate with myself about whether it actually overshadowed the collection for me mm. and personally it did it did yeah mm. it, it did I, and it was more rather than i was very interested in there being this big feminist debate raised and i think the feminist debate has been raised because of these kind of images um because you see lots of feminist slogans in this but the slogans weren't all feminist they were lots of different political things just kind of meaninglessly mashed together and that was my issue was seeing the <coughs> juxtaposition of of slogans that were about selling clothes with the juxtapositions of, of things that were making genuine political or should be yeah. making genuine political points. 
and I wouldn't have minded if it was all political, and I wouldn't have minded if it was all selling clothes, but mashing the two together was, was the issue for me. I don't think the polemic of genuine protest should be used to try and sell clothes. Yeah. And the fact they came out asking, what do we want, tweed? <laughs> was, I had a big, and I know <laughs> it's me being very... It quite amused me, to be honest. Easter is her and story. Jose, I mean, Jose, not Jose. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of, I know, and I do think yeah. it's like when one. you see what was happening at the same time, you know, it would be easy not. It would have been easy not to have done this. Yeah, yeah I know it would have been easy not to do this. It would have been easy not to do anything else that Chanel does every season. Yeah, but no. Day, but you know. this would have been easy. This added yeah. nothing to the clouds. And like you said, I if I was looking just at the clouds, I actually loved it as a collection until this started. But it is. I the loved the collection, I, but I hated the end. Hated the end. Did of you the find show. it remotely offensive? Uh, no, I know. I just found it very melancholy, yeah. um, and I thought that was. Um, I thought it was, because it, I'm thinking about what is going on, I, it, there's just this enormous sadness that, that things uh, go so far in the right direction and then swing wildly in the opposite yeah. direction. And um, I think that that's, it, that that's what that acknowledged, in a, in a, well to me anyway. But I, I, the whole package like that. But I think it's interesting that you say together. to you, because I think that's really important. And because I, what I found problematic about it is the way that it mean, the way it makes fashion look and the way that other people will read it. And I think fashion should consider that. And it just worried me to think, because it is just the commodification of feminism. And I think people outside of fashion will look at this and say, fashion is stupid. And then young girls will maybe look at it and think that you know, feminism is something that can be kind of bought in the same way you can buy into it. You know, it's but that's it, they've spun it into a fashion thing. The slogans yeah. that I saw, the, the, the thing that I referenced and the juxtaposition that actually kind of offended me was, and oddly the thing that one of my news editors who's not into fashion mm. at all raised was, because I said, oh, the, the slogans generally were meaningless. And he said, oh, yeah. but <coughs> there, there was one that said, make fashion, not war, which seems sensible. And I was like, yeah, actually that does. And the juxtaposition position yeah. I saw was that next to tweed is better than tweet, which means not men should get yeah. pregnant. And that's, but it's, it's that, you know, it was, it was that <laughs> juxtaposition. It you laugh. I mean, you know. But it was the juxtaposition of yeah. meaningless with stuff. With meaningful. With meaningful. And yeah. specifically for me with things that were, were brand focused and were kind of a yeah. sales tactic juxtaposed with a genuine political but message that, and I do believe yeah. that fashion can have a political message and that fashion is politicized and it's you know an incredibly political thing is what you put on your back and to I guess it's quite Lagerfeldian to to deny that and to make it very surface based but to also yeah. raise raise this debate about context which it which it did do um, and and context is is king. Uh, it, it, so much of so much of what is going on now, it, 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 it gains its power, or it's completely stripped of its power by the context in which it's happening. Mm. And I, I think I, <coughs> I, I think he he has such a sort of. Um, how, to to no, I just want to. I have to look it up. <laughs> um, I'm, I am. Um, I, I think he his picture of his picture of culture is, is sort of different from. I, th I think he has this sort of really, really long view of things, mm. and and it'd be interesting um, because obviously talking to him afterwards, he's just talking about how his mother was a feminist and all mm. that kind of stuff. But I would love to know um, if if I would love to know what his long view of this is. If he actually, if he actually could kind of contextualize it in a slightly different way, mm. or whether he is just get, looking to get under people's skin. I mean, the other thing for me is, I guess, if it was, would it have had the same for, for me would it have it would have still I would have still had a problem with it six months ago but I don't I wouldn't have had as much a problem with it as I did because you know what's going on outside of your window mm. I'm really my kind of my, my point with this is that it, it would have been quite a simple thing to not do but it was interesting that Just people this. who thought he did it because of Hong Kong which yeah I mean that's, that's, that's really, really strange which is yeah. and you're, you're right I, 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 Sorry? I got, you're right, I got told that he came up with this in March. Yeah, like yeah. in March he knew he was doing this. But I do think that it's kind of, you open a newspaper and be like, oh, this is happening. Maybe this is a really stupid idea. Yeah. You know, I think that there should be some kind of awareness of what's going on. You can't purely operate in a bubble. Jess, what was your take on it? 
Um, I actually wanted to pick up on the um, sort of, you know, the Tweed's tweet and the sort of, and going back to Dries actually in kind of context, because what I really liked about that show was as it sort of started and the girls came out, there was just sort of like this sound of birds tweeting. And for me, yeah. that kind of made me rethink what we thought tweeting was. You know, as we all sat there <laughs> tweeting, there were birds tweeting. And it used to be like a natural thing. Yeah. Um, and I just found that really interesting. And the kind of, you know, this kind of social media democracy. Um, and that's kind of interesting because as, even though you say, like some of those were kind of quite superfluous and didn't really mean anything. Um, and it's tricky with, with Chanel. I mean, I agree with like the collection. I thought it was really lovely. Um, but yeah, mm. it's one of those tricky kind of contextual things and especially the juxtaposition of some meaning stuff and some not so much. Um, yeah. How did the Vogue reader respond when you put the images up on social media? Mm. Or d did you find that kind of the women who read Vogue were saying, this is stupid, or would they say, oh, that looks cool? No, I mean, they, they went down well. I think people probably actually more looking at the collection. And of course, if you think about it um, in terms of a screen, that's really like one image. So, yeah. you know, so I think from that point of view. Yeah, actually, has, has there been any um, uh, back, not backlash, has there any, any consumers or readers um, comments on this? I think there's been quite a lot of comments if you read up pieces that have been written where there's I've a comment read, thread. I've read pieces on papers yeah. and newspapers and everything but else, but not very negative. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing back. Yeah. But, okay. When there's comment threads available on those articles mm. where comment users can write, something, I think people have. <coughs> I don't. I don't read the comments. <laughs> it, Why not? Because it petrifies me, and because it 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 kind of alarms me the number of people that will bother to comment on fashion. And actually, part of my <laughs> issue with this, no, the people that will bother to comment on fashion and say, well, this doesn't matter. Well, this okay. is meaningless, and that really annoys me. And then I want to get into debates with people about why it does matter, and how it's the second biggest employer in the UK, and how if fashion didn't matter, you'd be wearing a tabard or a toga. <laughs> and then, obviously, we, we don't want to get into that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it constantly surprises me. I guess the people that bother to comment generally are the the people that strongly disagree with it. So, yeah. so no, maybe yeah. that's the, the reflection online will probably be people saying oh yes, this is, this is ridiculous, or yeah. this is completely pointless, or yeah. it's full of thin people, or you all have too much money, mm -hmm. or and not enough sense. You know, those are generally the comments that you get on, on fashion pieces online, unless you're on a lovely thing like style.com, which has comments from me saying how much I love various uh, Excuse films. me, I hope you do the same with you. No. But Tim does... does He's so giving. He does my films. <laughs> <laughs> he does films of old Galliano shows, and that gets me, gets, gets me going. You mentioned Galliano. Yeah, I'm, so very, yeah, I'm very happy Galliano is going I'm to be very happy. Yeah, let's, let's talk about the other I follow, story. I follow you on Instagram. It's every day there's a new, new, there's lots a new of Galliano um, uh, scrubbing the floor. picture from yeah. John. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 That, on that we agree, I yeah. must say. Yeah. So. Uh, let, well, let's happy. have a look at the last Manjola collection we just saw, because it's interesting to imagine what it will be like under mm -hmm. Galliano, what are we hoping for? I don't think it's going to be really, I don't know, for me, I think it's a kind of quite interestingly sort of polar opposite yeah. uh, joining forces um, in terms of sort of the way uh, Margiela works and then obviously Galliano is kind of Galliano, he's the, the central figure um, and his sort of aesthetic is far more flamboyant than, than Margiela really kind of is. So I don't know, I think it's going to be quite interesting to see, but, mm. and also I thought this Margiela collection was really beautiful, yeah. I really, really loved it. Um, in a way that I haven't personally sort of necessarily loved them so much before. Um, so I don't know. For me, I think it's kind of going to be interesting. It's, mm. it's not I my kind of first I want choice. Be, I want to be happily surprised, to be honest. Mm. Can't I wait for January. If you, if I don't even it. want to think, you know, the, the you know the bias cut meets, you know, the linear yeah. curves or the, the 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 minimalism of whatever of uh, Margiela. But I just want to be completely okay. again. Maybe I'm becoming incredibly cynical in a different <laughs> way, completely out of everything. I just want to see clothes. And I mean, if you think about, say, the, the, the collection that, that Galliano showed in the Schlumberger mansion, mm. you know, mm. the one that really brought him everything that happened to him after that, there's a sort of rigor in that, that, mm. um, you know, people talk about his sort of epic romantic yeah. um, impulses, but he actually did do some pretty rigorous clothes mm. over the years mm -hmm. as well. Mm. And then, of course, there's Margiela, the art, the artisanal collection. That was mm. that was pretty romantic. That was a really beautiful, yeah, yeah. Last design yeah. collection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, so there's a funny, funny compatibility. Mm. Perhaps I That's think the, I think there is. Happy marriage. I mm. think for me, there's the interesting thing where there's. I think both Galliano and Margiela there was this focus on memory and on, of history and of exploring that and weirdly that we started off talking about history but this idea of, of memory through cloth 
um, and also that idea of craftsmanship. I think it's interesting if you hear him, we talk about him as a, a singular talent, but when he, I remember that fantastic South Bank show where he takes you and introduces you to the tailors when he was at Givenchy and he's in, introducing you to the team and he talks about Amanda and he talks about, about um, the late Stephen yeah. Robinson and about Bill Gayton and about how the team all work together, which actually is Margiela in that collective sense of this, mm -hmm. is, this is a group of people working towards a whole, which he's worked in, in couture houses and couture, you know you can't do a couture collection by yourself. Yeah. So I think, but, but the comment you made about South Schlumberger and about that kind of working in dire straits, working in penury and, and mm -hmm. creating something out of nothing. So and at the same time, ripping, straight. but having something and ripping it apart. Like I, you know, obviously thinking of the the homeless collection, but also the Matrix collection, which was about displacing garments so a coat would become a skirt. And then yeah. that fantastic childhood collection. Not that I'm going to go through the whole archive and illustrate why it's fantastic. No, please but go on. Actually, it's amazing. Special subject. But, and also, yeah, no. <laughs> But, and also the stuff in the 80s when he was looking at reconfiguring the way that clothes, you know, so a sweater would become a skirt or a pair of trousers would become mm. a jacket. I think but you everybody knows him, print, but it? everybody knows him of, as this big thing of, and you know, mm. everyone thinks it's, it's big ball games and it's not, there's, there's no. so much. And it's some of the thing that I'm happiest about is that what he created is some of the greatest clothes created at the end of the 20th century. And you can't not be happy to have somebody fantastic coming back to do more fantastic things. Do we understand why there have been so many comment pieces written that, like the Chanel protest, use this as another example of fashion being ignorant or stupid? Because there have been some pieces written about, I think, actually about the way the fashion industry has conducted itself in the reporting on this appointment, which kind of gloss over and say things like, you know, post troubles and things like that. And you know, Jess Kant really wrote a good piece in The Guardian about that, where she said, you know, actually, the fashion industry itself needs to acknowledge it, not leave it to kind of other commentators to point at fashion and say, isn't fashion being stupid again? What did you read, Bridget Foley? No. In Women's Wear? Uh, did you read it? Yeah. yeah. What did you think of that piece? I thought she covered the waterfront. Well, I think, because I did a piece on Monday where I was, for me, it's very much kind of, I mean, my point of view is he was, he, he committed a crime which has been tried for and prosecuted for and has paid his debt. That's it. And everybody's entitled to a second no, job. I think that's the whole I'm not judicial necessarily system. asking about whether he should be allowed a second job. It's more the way fashion kind of does that, like, I think the point she was it. making is that Europe and America have very different attitudes to, yeah. to, uh, to this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, whereas Europe, uh, the old world, um, you know, time moves on and, and everybody becomes like, oh, you know, shrug the, shrug the shoulder and mm -hmm. move yeah. on. America, the new world, uh, holds fast to the insult and the memory of the insult. So um, that's, that's basically the point she was making. Mm. Mm -hmm. no, but I, I, I mean, personally, I don't think making one mistake should obliterate your career. The, the concern that I have, and I actually think that fashion is, is kind of lifting John up because I think a lot of the world will not forget and that he will be tainted in the wider world. And that for me personally is, is a concern that it might be something that that might be what he's known for rather than his work. Well, absolutely, because, no, uh, because no, no, I don't think of course, it's not what no, Chanel was known for, despite the fact that Chanel, d despite the fact Chanel slept with a Nazi officer yeah. and was put in exile in Switzerland. But that's yes. another example of the fashion press where if you read books on Chanel, they will kind of like ignore that as if it... No, there is, there's a book I called um, like Coco Chanel Secret War, yeah. which is only about that. And also the but thing like about Chanel. Cecil Beaton and the anti-Semitic mm. insults yeah. that he wrote. And also I think that there is alcohol in legalese is a mitigating factor. It doesn't absolve you of responsibility, but it can be taken into account in your... Yeah, and also in the digital yeah. age, what that's he the, actually yes. do, what he actually did, lives in eternity. Whereas mm. whatever mm. Chanel did yeah, or said yeah. wasn't was it was wasn't even written down. Never mind mm. filmed. And, and it's and also and easily glossed over. I think. Yeah. When, I don't, think it, was, I don't think it was so easily glossed. I mean, she was exiled for a, yeah. for, a mm -hmm. for a long, long time, and it did it, that that 
I mean, I know that. But I it, think it now it's old. glossed over for a lot of people. Like yeah, if you read a magazine article on Chanel, it, mm. it isn't reference. You're right; there are books that do it, but it's kind of it's not. I don't. But I think it would then also been easier to to hide certain things in the mm. past. I mean, now yeah, it's all out there. Yeah. So but I also yeah. think talking yeah. about criticizing the fashion press for only writing about this is, is slightly a reduction. I have I had 600 words to write about this, like. So I can't go into a massive explanation of my whole feelings yeah. on the whole thing because I have a finite amount of newsprint. No, like, of course. Which I think is, yeah. is something, and even in the internet, even on the internet, I can't write 10,000 words, which I probably could write 10,000 words, <laughs> but, but who's well. going to read it? No, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I guess I'm playing devil's advocate in a way. I'm just intrigued as, it, I think it's another example of where it puts the fashion press in a tricky position about whether the fashion press's job is to analyse the clothes and kind of go, oh, everything else aside, or whether it is to talk about things like whether doing a protest when what's happening in the world is appropriate, about whether this man's past means he should have a second time. And it's really difficult. I think it's a difficult time for the fashion press because it's like if you ignore it, you're seen as being stupid. But if you talk about it, then it's like, hang on, but let's just look at the clothes. And I think it's a tricky time. I guess mm. that's what I'm asking. I feel like it's going to be really difficult for the fashion press, as much as it is for John Gilliam. But there's a, hu there's a huge, um, there's a, a much bigger issue there, I think, um, beyond it, its whole notion of forgiveness and altruism yes. and, you know, that the, the world is supposed to be, that there's, there are books coming out about how the only thing that's going to save the human race is kindness. Mm. Um, there was a, 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 the notion that, that um, apparently, uh, what is it? Um, uh, evolution in, in terms of evolution yeah that unless we evolve towards a kind of a kind of kind of organism we're doomed um, in, in sort of very very fundamental ways and the, the, the we, we we are where we are because there was kindness at some point and we've lost such or that so I think that there's a you know that's a that's a huge point too and and mm -hmm. I think um, it's very interesting actually it's interesting that fashion is where some of these things focus um, mm. and the books I guess because it's such a graphic a graphic um, thing and it's perceived as so superficial by so many people exactly. that, that the fact that it wrestles with you know bigger issues is a is a inflammatory to some people mm. maybe and it is incredibly interesting when you think about other characters in the creative even just specifically in the creative arts who've had controversy surrounding their personal life if you look in the world of film you know there are countless examples mm. who yet continue to make we are wonderful creative well Lenny Riefenstahl you know I mean she's yeah. a mm. absolutely gold yeah. Example. yeah and I do find it interesting how much kind of bitterness is directed towards the fashion industry for this level of forgiveness that we're discussing when it isn't in the same way like the film industry but I the think there industry. is in the, as, like I was saying when you look at things like online comments I think at the fashion industry generally is assume you know it's assumed to be superficial, um, you know, preoccupied with people that uh, think everyone should be thinner, think everyone should be spending a lot of money on clothes, think everyone should burn all their clothes. You know, it, it's it's, and I guess because there's this built-in obsolescence, which is a little bit obscene as a concept, and that's how people perceive fashion. That you're telling everyone to throw everything out and change that it. That is but what it's, it's telling people. It's really. morally corrupt by its very nature. And I think that's what, you know, and a lot of people just think, well, you shouldn't be, there's better things to spend money on. And spending money on this is vanity, which is a sin. You know, I think there's a lot of, specifically in England and, and America, I think there's a lot of lingering. Calvinism. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Puritanism. Whereas I think in, in, in Italy and in France, it's, you know, it's much more a part of, of their culture. And it's, it's something sure. that, as, as I know, it's something that Italian and French people are incredibly proud of their fashion industry and, yeah. uh, you know, Whereas and are proud kind of, of what ashamed it represents. Of it, yeah. I think, think we're massively ashamed of it. Yeah. Don't you think the lust for novelty is a sort of human, a sort of pretty fundamental change? Changes, yeah. the, yeah. changes yeah. the greatest so aphrodisiac. Yeah, yeah, that fashion is just the, is just one more expression of that, you know. Mm. That, it that is. Every mm. single thing we're involved in, um, there's new, new uh, 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 the, the developments, developments in everything are sold to us as new. Mm. You know, whether it's a TV show or a ballet or a book. But I think or in, with high fashion, it's specifically viewed as 
you're spending too much money on something. It's pointless. intriguing that that hasn't come to tar technology, which I think is becoming increasingly mm-hmm. more like mm-hmm. fashion with the kind of six month cycles and kind of. I think it's even worse. Yeah. The yes. fact you buy a computer yes. and then it stops it working yes. two years. Or you, or down you down can't buy parts that fit in the world of art. I mean, it's it's actually happening there as well. I mean, how many how many fashion how many art fairs are we now? But you see, I think it's like a production of five six collections for a designer. I think all of those things are taking lessons from the world of fashion. Absolutely, of course they are. Technology is following, is copying fashion. Yes, and that's absolutely. Making things disposable. Making but technology is clever because it can make <laughs> things that actually do break two years after you buy a laptop that then yeah. explodes during Paris Fashion Week and then home, you're stranded. The thing with fashion is there's that sort of like emotional attachment invested in it. Like, yeah. Whereas yeah. when you're talking about technology that's pragmatic and with various other things, they're just much more sort of, yeah, pragmatic or practical. But with fashion, you it's that that lust for the new yeah. and when you see something and it's again it's about that context where you go oh even though you know yeah. you've seen it before but suddenly housed in this context you're like that's amazing and yeah. that's mm-hmm. what really sort of tugs on us so what did well, you think a lot of psychological it? moment you know to 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 to, to uh, get attracted by fashion clothes and everything else i mean there's so many elements of mm. just why uh, this becomes desirable you know the press mm. can write everything about a certain dress or a certain design or a certain collection but at the end of the day it's always you and your choice you know mm. to, to, to so what did you think of albert elbaz because that was very much seemed to, uh, that very much seemed to be what was on his mind uh, the idea of emotion and and mm. a sort of counteracting you know uh counteracting needless obsolescence you know mm. he, that's why he wanted all these different women, mm. like the, the, the different th- ages of women in his mm. shows, and the, and, and the clothes, I thought, um, and it, well, it was that idea of referencing his own history, actually. Yeah, and actually, I thought it was one of, <laughs> one of the best shows in Paris, mm. the Lambin one. I mean, it was not, not his best as a Lambin itself, but in the season of Paris, I think he was, he was quite pure and uh, actually loved it. Mm-hmm. Again, looking always at the clothes and not waiting, you know, for an hour to some celebrity to turn up. Oh, it's a notion that if you want to go on deeply on other no. elements surrounding it. No, he insisted he'd been look, sitting in cafes watching women go by. Mm-hmm. You know, not not fashion plates, but well, um, that is, and he sort of distilled that mm. into. I don't know how, how you feel about whether he managed to do that or not. But well, it's funny, because obviously this was the uh, 125th anniversary, wasn't it? And I sort of went into it thinking, oh, it's going to be, you know, like balloons and bells and really and, and really, and I, and it was, it was much sort of more downbeat. And of course there was like a great um, uh, cast of models, but it, yeah, it was one of those ones when I sat there initially, I was kind of like, oh, but retrospectively, Mm. And again, what we've been discussing and kind of that idea of actually doing stuff that is a bit more relevant, he's, yeah, he, I in that respect. I actually prefer yeah. a celebrating collection like this rather than, you know, celebrating 125th anniversary with ball, you know, mm. balloons and bells and, I don't know, ball gowns and 500 yeah. meters and 500 models or whatever. I mean, it makes yeah, much more sense, sense today to do a yeah. proper collection that makes sense and it's beautiful and, you know, having Violetta Sanchez opening it is great. Mm. Alex, Alex has gone into a fugue state. <laughs> <laughs> I do worry though, it's interesting what you say, because I worry a bit, and this is me just being a, a natural worrier, but talking about, we were talking about the, the commodification of feminism, and I sometimes get a bit concerned about this like commodification of the real woman, or the commodification of relevance, mm-hmm. which I think is happening loads. This idea is like, oh, I was looking at real women, I was looking at women of all mm. ages. Like, it's well, such a... It should be, you're a fashion well, I, I, I wonder, I wonder what... The uh, idea of the real uh, woman is, is kind of laughable. Yeah. The idea of real exactly. anything. Yeah. I wonder what Olivia Rustan thinks when he thinks about the real woman. But what is the real woman? It's a exactly. Exactly. You know, when you say, okay, so you say what women. about sitting on a cafe? What about Oliver Rustang sitting in a cafe and watching the, the women pass by and then you see the collection? Mm. Mm. Then that's mm. a big question mark for me rather than yeah. tweet is better than tweet or whatever. Mm. That is, again, you know, if you want to go a bit deeper. So does that, that mean the real woman is opposed to the fashion woman? Yeah. yeah is that what I th- you say? Yeah, I think it is, which I find quite... So maybe it's your real woman which... You know, the Balmain real woman is, um, <laughs> yeah. she's a certain type of real woman. And, you know, you, mm. you get, but I get that feeling with a lot of, and actually you got that feeling, Benji I think, really. a lot in in Paris, there were very, you know, some designers just really did what they do. Oh, yeah. Like Givenchy was, was a very mm. specific vision of a woman. And some women will wear it, and some women wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. And but the same with yeah. Balmain, it's like, yeah, it's, it's Balmain, you know. Actually this will appeal to a certain type of woman and actually I quite like it when designers are quite hardcore and when it's like this is this is for you and this is not for you. Mm. I'm, I'm not saying that you know I think his collection you know worked for the Balmain woman mm. you know for that the, 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 how do you say for that trademark that he's created mm. yeah. and created before but 
again, you know, if you want to um, say, okay, this is the woman in, in the world, that's how it should be seen, then I can start now being a bit like, okay, maybe I should pull back. And then, you know, again, like when we were talking about the Tom Ford collection. Mm. So it's... Don't it's get Alex started on Tom no, Ford. No, exactly. It can be debatable. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> What Tom did you Ford think of Tom Ford, actually? Oh, no, we're, we're doing Paris. <laughs> we're doing Paris. Yeah, you don't want to put it. We're doing Paris. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, when you talk about designers saying that this is what I do and it's for you, it's for you and it's not for you. That's yeah. what all fashion used to be like that. It used yeah. to be no, it's yeah. Yeah. Very, I think yeah. now it's much more... I, and I felt, for I felt there was a lot of collections this season and I, I, I wrote this word, as opposed to this is for you and not for you. There's a lot of people where it's like, here's some stuff on a catwalk, I hope somebody somewhere buys some of it. Yeah. There were these really desperate collections Who did that those? had so much. I'm not going to say, but there was Why quite not? a few. Why aren't you going to say? Because, because they weren't in Paris. The ones I'm specifically thinking okay. of, and we're discussing Paris at the moment, Louisa. Um, <laughs> but Louisa. <laughs> I so there were. Um, I think there were a lot of people that were really just throwing a huge variety, and it, it's fine. You've got to you've got to make your bottom line. You've got to make yeah. your sales. But I don't find that a kind of interesting seductive vision of you well, know I think, yeah. of and it's not it doesn't really, have an identity did you really feel that none of them were in paris the ones that don't leap out to me were ones in paris so i love what i loved yeah. about celine is is that it, it just it, it well phoebe phoebe actually said it wasn't edited she yeah. she just let it go yeah. and i just like the fact that there was so much in that collection that it was, I suppose, in, in Celine's terms, it was kind of chaotic. Yeah. And I, I really, and I really loved that. I felt, I wouldn't say Dries's collection was chaotic, but there was, a, there was so much in it yeah. that you wouldn't say there was one precise mm -hmm. point of view. But that's really that interesting, isn't it, to think about this idea of having a really specific point of view without doing something that's incredibly specific. Mm -hmm. Because I think often we associate, you know, doing a very strong collection and it was having a very clear focus and I think there were a lot of really strong collections that did have that wide wide focus. Without being wishy-washy mm. exactly. something for everyone. Exactly. Yeah. So the opposite yeah. of what Alex is talking about but equally as diverse. Yeah I think yeah. Vuitton was a, uh, was a very diverse collection it had a lot of elements to it yeah, but at the same yeah. time it was, it was incredibly was strong and had yeah. a very specific point well, of view. Dries. I mean. Oh no I mean Vuitton. Oh uh, Vuitton sorry yeah. I said you said Dries. Um, yeah. But no you're right it is always Dries there is always a Dries is you know it's always like yeah. that yeah, fantastic. Exactly. But I think that's the thing with, you know, like most successful designers kind of need to, I think that's why like Saint Laurent when it sort of, when Hedy took over, because he was just doing the same look, it was like just that same silhouette, that same, and he was saying this is what I'm doing. And you look at every collection since, it's like, it's like variants of, but that's the stuff that stands out and that kind of hammers home a message. And I think that's quite like an important... Except this thing. one, I, I, yeah. I just, I, I really, I really like this one. I'm, I mean, yeah, I yeah, just, that's great. I just thought that um, as he explores his own... You know, Why does he own, like that that much? His own fandom. Well, you know, he's. It's like he's moving through the, the many, like the many, the, you know, the seven ages of rock. It's right. Like <laughs> going from garage <laughs> rock to to um. And this is the seventh. To, to uh, psychedelic, the last one, and this one was that that sort of the glam moment mm. in Paris when Warhol was filming *L'Amour* with Jane Forth and Donna Jordan. I mean, the whole thing's so archaeological, but. Um, and, and the turbans and all of that, which were Jane Forth and Donna Jordan, and uh, it, and then. I thought what he did very cleverly, and maybe I'm completely wrong, but he, he wired in th that sort of LA um, mm. element yeah. from the same period with Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco and those amazing 13-year-old groupies, like almost like Jodie Foster and Taxi Driver, but mm. much, much better. Look, but, the, but you know, the <laughs> stars and the... And then to, to do that sort of embroidered starburst stuff like that the was at the end was... That was I, quite I, fun. Thought it was, I thought it all came together mm. really, really well, this, this show. His kind of obsession. Yep. And um, the shoes are amazing. Yes, yes. And, and this, that sort of obsessive recreation of something, uh, you know, of, of, of the, like a fan, like a, mm. like a tribute band, yep. but brilliantly done. Mm. But you say recreation, not design. <clears throat> Well, you know, the, the, the thing about designers revisiting their past, mm. musicians, I think it's more and more, I, I'm amazed that more designers don't go back and, and look at what they did and, and, and hone what they did. I think that's what Christopher Kane does so cleverly is, is pulling bits from his past and honing them with, with the, 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 the expertise that mm -hmm. he has and, and making them the way they were in his head when he first thought mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm surprised more people don't do that the way musicians do or writers do. You know? It doesn't feel like he's revisiting his 
past no, no, but he's revisiting. You know, this, this whole kind of. Uh, he wasn't there at the time. Yeah. But 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 it's that whole wish fulfillment thing that you look at, you look at, like Anna Sui, who I who I, I love for I that reason as well. That she can she's just so passionate about. She wasn't at the factory, or she wasn't at Woodstock, or she wasn't. You know, she wasn't dancing at Castells in the early seventies, or but so she just makes it. You know, yeah. for but herself, and and um, I think, I don't know. I, I suppose a lot of people feel that's 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 um, a kind of maybe a dead end. But I just think there's a lot of joy in it. I think Do you think it's doing more commercially? What well, is doing? Yeah. It's incredible. Doing I think like this one's doing, you this know, one wearable and comfortable. I think my into. my issue, and I'm interested to see what you guys think. It, what I find troublesome about it is. The re De I love the idea of recreation of mood and a recreation of spirit. I think that's charming and interesting and intriguing. But a stitch for stitch? A stitch yeah, for stitch. you have a problem with that. I have a mm -hmm. problem with that. Mm -hmm. And it worries me that people don't, I think. Well, I didn't feel I, I didn't feel this stitch for stitch the way I did some of the other ones. Really? You know, <laughs> no, really. Maybe because I just love the period so You're much. Just a great time. I'm perfectly happy to kind of look at those shoes trotting by. Yeah. Um, and and you know, I think that there are just some sort of benchmark moments. Um, I'm talking about idealism. I don't know whether these are particularly idealistic, but I was intrigued that um, Jessica was talking about Edie Sedgwick. Yeah. In in the context of Louis Vuitton, I mean, there are just things that fashion designers cannot get away from yeah and the factory is definitely one of them Warhol yeah. and all those people um, but this was a bit of a season for that of kind of tired fashion cliches but done in quite an interesting way <laughs> which I quite like that's interesting yeah well it's comforting I suppose for a lot yeah. of designer to go on a safer um, idea yeah in a way, no? maybe what do you think of the stitch for stitch thing Alex I know you don't like talking about San Laurent but this idea of kind of copying vintage um, I think there's a lot of it, and I'm interested in what we define vintage. Do we define old Chloe from like ten years ago as vintage? Anything older than ten years, apparently. Okay, it's okay. yeah. kind of ten years. I, I thought you had reduced. Ten years to five and ten years minutes. Now. <laughs> it's reduced to five years now. Oh, is it? Yeah. I, just I thought, thought, it, thought, thought it got reduced. Years. Years. I thought that for auction houses. I thought it was like Prada years. from two seasons ago. <laughs> <laughs> to vintage now, like. Oh, I think you've all forgotten this. We talked about this in the Milan panel. I actually really want to know what, what you guys who do pen reviews think about this. And we talked about how kind of the last taboo, it seems, in fashion criticism is people will be really opinionated, but no one is willing, except on social media, to say this copied that. Why not? I said it. You don't say it as boldly as you would on something like your Facebook. No, I, I said it. I wrote that I, I thought Alexander Wang copied 2001 Balenciaga, and I saw a spring 2013 Balenciaga outfit four times in New York, the bra top and the trousers. I saw yeah. it three times in Arts and the Wang show. Yeah. And um, someone has posted a thing on, on, uh, on the Balmain, there was a Balmain yeah, jacket Balmain or something, you know, the, the Givenchy, yeah. the, yeah. the knot, the, the, the white knot. The that actually made me laugh so much. The artist Tauber Auerbach's earrings were in Lueve. <laughs> the earrings that she did. And, and in fact, she was being congratulated by people. <laughs> but all, all you know how, how wonderful that how visionary that 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 her, that the way was using her earrings and she said they're not mine they're not mine but people don't write <laughs> about it very much do they this explicit this was a copy of that i think it's it's for me i found it because i said something last season about victoria beckham looking like celine and then and somebody raised a point again i did read a comment that season and someone raised a point which which i thought was actually very valid they were like well you're saying that she's copying celine what about everyone else and I was like, yeah, it's kind of a slippery slope where how far do you go down ripping exactly. apart people's references yeah, and saying, Alex, but there are no, no, no that's but, but you know what, what, what I've always said, but there's a lot of it, how do you, what I've always yeah. said, I mean, it's new, if it's new, if it's new to the people who are looking at it, then it's new, yeah. you know, yeah. that I, I could go on and on and on about things I've seen, uh, you know, over and over again, but I've been looking at fashion shows for decades and I'm not going to presume that, that my whiskery old yeah. kind of overview is shared by a by a by a you know eighteen year old who's seeing something. But is it not important to say something? This is Yoji. Have a look at Yoji. Well, it depends how synthesised yeah. it is as well. Mm -hmm. I think if it's a piece for piece copy, that's an issue. Yeah. But I think if somebody's taken it, and a lot of designers that you wouldn't expect reference yeah. other designers' recent work, yeah. and yeah. it's literally like, okay, so here's a sleeve from 
Gasquier Balenciaga 2008. And this is an illustration of what I want it to look like. It's not, let's copy this. Yeah. It's, Actually, you know, people people use other garments and they use them in inventive ways. And sometimes it's like, well, let's let's use this and get the pattern and then let's change the pattern. Mm. It's, it depends how much somebody works it and gives it their own identity. Yeah. Actually, I think there was a lot of that. Going back, because all of a sudden I got this flashback of being in Paris. I was in another mood. But um, there was a lot of that this season. I mean, also a great design. I mean, a design that I normally love. You know, it did actually, pra talking about Prada of uh, maybe four <coughs> or five years ago, you know, mm. the, with the leather fringe with the rivets or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you remember that collection. I was just, oh God, why? Mm. And then you just, you I get very upset when someone were like and appreciate his work, just go back so closely to some mm. collection. We'll see what yeah, Chris Kane did with, he, he said he was tired of seeing things that he had done ages ago in other collections. So he said he, re he wanted to reclaim them, yeah. you know, for himself. Fine. Mm. But, but when, you say, when you say like, you know, you, if you said to somebody, that's old Yoji, what do you want them to do with that information? Go and buy old Yoji or... Or, just know. Or, you, or, or are you attempting to sort of kill their enjoyment of the thing they're looking yeah, at by yeah. telling them that it's you know the duplicate of something that happened 25 I'm the years ago? Killer, that's my that's my <laughs> rule. <laughs> uh -huh. Let's talk more about Louis because you just mentioned it. Obviously, it was an important season mm -hmm. and an important collection because it was in in some ways J W Anderson's debut. He did d debut with the men's, mm -hmm. but in a slightly less um, uh, less extravagant fashion because he didn't do a show. You mentioned the kind of um, borrowed earrings, but what was our take on the rest of the show? I personally really loved it. I, I, I really like the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, really I liked it, but I found it too complicated. I feel like it, it's actually interesting you talked about menswear and women's wear because I feel like at times it got really tied up in being a catwalk show and, on, yeah. and yeah. making a catwalk oh, statement. Yeah. Whereas actually I was looking at things and being like, well this, you know, that opening look is like, oh, it's, it's a blown up the wave, a handbag with a, a good Loewe handbag. And yeah. so I feel sometimes it got tied up in trying maybe to be conceptual but or seemed. trying to present something directional as opposed to making garments. I, and when the garments I find it incredibly right. complicated. I mean, sometimes, it, you know, I but then know, these, I mean, these t-shirts, they're fantastic. They're yeah. going to be like the next, you know, like Kenzo's jumper. I'm saying the whole thing, but right. a lot of it did get tied up in that. And then mm. you saw the jumper, you know, there were like three jumpers mm. with the leather patching yeah. on the yeah. left shoulder. And I was like, great, clothes. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a great trench coat, there's some great trousers, but then there's these things that seem to be assemblages of, of bits. But I felt like that kind of harked back to like JW when he first started out, because you look when he started out, it's so very sort of artisanal and crafty and very different to kind of the much more structured sort of stuff he does now. So I kind of like those wisps, wisps rather of, of that in this. And it kind of, for me, as he had said, you know, he was taking much more of like a lighter point of view. Mm. Um, yeah, and I just, it was kind of the first time I kind of sat up and was like, oh, whatever. Like it was more yeah. interesting, wearable, and kind of spoke to but me. But I think it, what happened ha happened here is it was happening in his own collections as well mm. for men and for women. That he's just really he's really found a direction, and um, I felt there was less in in the past. He would there would be things that I, th I felt were a bit gratuitous that he did them for the for their own sake, you know. Mm -hmm. and I, f I feel that there's real he's really solid now. That yeah. Yeah. there was I mean, the, the three collections, the men's and women's, and this one. Yeah. I thought were really. But see, I felt there were bits in this where I, you know that opening. I hop back to that opening look, but there are others where I'm just like, it feels so much like you're trying to emphasize, this is artisanal. So here's lots of bits on something. I like, you know, this is. I thought it was more here witty than that. Here are yeah. scraps from the floor. But it's always. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but no, it, it just felt though. quite obvious to but me. Like, here are scraps from the floor. But he's an obvious designer. He's, he's, yeah. he's, yeah. well, I don't think he's an obvious designer. No, I think that's what he's trying to be. He does his element from the very beginning. He's always had a little bit of concept of overthinking. Whereas I think he's overthinking. And we're following on from the men's collection, Fluewe, which I loved for the fact that. You know, people th think of Lueve as Madrid, mm. the, Ma the, the Spain of Madrid. Mm. He did the Spain of the Balearics. 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 Oink. Um, like Formentera. <laughs> and it, it had that sort of. And, and, and you know, those dresses with the stuff stunk, stuck, st stuck on them, just hanging off. You're right. <laughs> like, um, no, you mean my, my speech impediment? Yes. It's my fevered, fevered brow. Uh, I, I think there was this, uh, that funny sense of just being a hippie sitting under a piece of muslin in Formentera, just stitching things on a. But I, for me, it felt too. I wish someone did that. It just felt too done. Like, and weirdly, I um, spoke with somebody, and, and her comment about it was, "Well, if he's going to do that, you should tell him not to make everything the same size." 
don't make all the pieces the same size. And I was like, that's quite an interesting where it's, it's which was somebody being like, this doesn't look real. And I think slightly for me, that's, I don't feel like those are real bits that you've put, and I mean, obviously they're not, but I don't feel like they're real pieces. So um, I just like you making polished real clothes. And I felt in London, the London collection was so much yeah. about polished real yeah. clothes. Yeah. And maybe this was a counteraction to that, but I felt like it was a bit trying to make this big catwalk statement. Uh, it was trying to be a catwalk show rather than showing clothes. In that environment, in that, in that, in that mm. But the bags were fantastic. I was going to say, the bags, amazing. The other yeah. slight issue for me is sometimes with these constructions, I felt like here is a background to a fantastic bag. Like here, here is an arrangement that's sh showcasing this wonderful bag. Yeah, which is well, that's probably realistic. That's yeah, really yeah, of course, well, of course you, you shouldn't just be making a plain outfit to showcase a bag. That's no, what not, I'm not saying of course in a good be. way, but I mean, like, I think that was almost definitely the intention. With some I don't it. think it. I don't think that was the oh, intention. Really? I don't think he was like, well, let's focus all the attention on the bag. But I think that's part of the DNA of the brand, then it is a big element for Louis. What about the judo pants in a rainbow of colours then? We should have all worn them. <laughs> <laughs> we missed a trick. Damn. <laughs> there is so much we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about McQueen. We haven't talked about Mimi. We haven't talked about Jean Paul Gaultier, which we probably should we talk about. We haven't talked about Com enough, I don't say. Okay, let's talk about Com for a bit then, because it was also my favourite collection. So. I think, oh, you know, in the general, I just say this and then because I'm terrified to talk with this too. But uh, <laughs> uh, in the general, um, blandness of Paris collection. I think, you know, more than ever, I loved Com and mm. Junior and uh, Undercover. I think they were all great collections, Undercover stronger was than amazing. ever. I mean, yeah. I mean it's, uh, I've always been a big fan, you know, with ups and downs, whatever, but, you know, literally, I was so thirsty to see some great, proper but fantasy clothes. Yeah. Renaissance in Japanese fashion. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. Definitely. Thankfully. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. pleased about it. So that my, f my quote on it. <laughs> Look at Junior. Alex, why did you say we haven't talked about Com enough? It was because it was fantastic. Because it was just this kind of... And it, you talked a bit about Gautier and a rock thing, talk, comparing Com and Gautier almost, but being <laughs> neither of them were really about the clothes. It was, which, which is interesting, because I do feel like other. it should be, but th these aren't clothes. Mm. These are mm -hmm. textile constructions, textile proposals on a body. And at Gautier, it was about this enormous celebration of this is me. I, you know, I love that Gautier did that Vogue thing, which felt like something he'd wanted to do for about 25 years. Like, I'm going to do a fashion show of girls dressed up as Vogue editors. And I just wish it had gone on forever. I just wish he'd done everybody in the industry. <laughs> do you wish you'd been I wish in I was <laughs> in that show. <laughs> Damn right. Quite a letter of complaint. How, would, how do you think he would have seen you? Yeah, how would what? you have been styled? Who would have modelled you? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know. Jamie Bush. So Jamie. much taller than Who? me. Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Um... um Julian Obis. But you know, I, I loved, <laughs> I loved that, and I think, you know, this is obviously a very, com is a very different beast to that. Yeah. But in the same way, it felt like it was, it was so much about this kind of enormous bold proposal, and actually a very, it was, in a way, so simple, but mm. proposing so much. You know, like your interpretations of red, and obviously you went into all this liturgical stuff about. Um, you know, about sumptuary laws, about Marie Antoinette, about Louis XIV, about blood, about war, about... Ju there's Fashion. just so much depth to it. It was such a, like, visceral, kind of meaty, no pun intended, collection. <laughs> and it was when it, it kept coming and coming and coming, it, it, was, it was just really incredible. Like, yeah. it, was, it really blew you away. And you, there is a lot to say, but I can't keep going on about it. It was just one of those moments where it was just something that was absolutely exceptional. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And Junior? I didn't go to Junior. Tisk Me neither. Um, did you um, love Com though? I didn't go to Com. Did you love it? Yeah, I did. I, 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 I thought both of these shows, uh, which I, I didn't go to either of them, but I, I thought they were incredible. What were you doing? In <laughs> what? What are you doing? We got Undercover. <laughs> Undercover was fabulous. Um, <laughs> but I like Saka. Junior actually, because Junior was sort I of that. Retro futurism. Yeah, again. and the interesting thing yeah. with Junior is that it went back to being that sort of bonkers side of Junior, whereas we've had the mm -hmm. you know the patchwork yeah. jeans and the jackets, so and it's been so zeitgeist, and everyone's yeah. been so cult about it, and then it's quite nice to then throw this back into the works. And I'm be just like, so oh. happy to look at it. I mean, mm. yeah. Mm. Uh, today I'm very superficial. I'm just like, yeah, I like it, and I'm happy. <laughs> Give me like pretty it, pictures and clothes, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be happy. You know. Um, let's talk about Jean-Paul just because we should and it was in Paris and it was Look obviously such a big moment. 
Are we, um, I asked this of the panel, they all said no, but are we sad to see him leave ready to wear? And some they all said no. No, but they said it's no. It's really <laughs> horrible. <laughs> no, not no, like, oh, we don't Good give a shit. Who said but that? Like, no, I was saying, like, we not asked me. this of the panel, but we talked about it in this idea of no, because he has so much other stuff that he can give and so much more to be excited about it would be simplistic just to be like oh he's failed and we shouldn't associate bowing well, out he's the not, it's, it, I think the, the, the mm. good thing is that it's him kind of pulling the plug yeah, and, yeah. you know yeah. it's him deciding yeah. you know what I want to step off this treadmill exactly, which that's is what very saying. interesting yes. yeah. to say I want to focus on this how and enviable. I am able to yeah. I mean, I'm sure you know like with Helmut Lang how many people envied Helmut Lang to, for, 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 to, you know, for a liar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, a liar, no, but a liar does it to his timetable. I mean, yeah, Helmut exactly. Lang just stopping and, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and doing it in his terms. Um, I, I, I thought it was such good. a gleeful show. It yeah. just felt like it was, it, it really felt like he was just like, bollocks, I'm just going to do exactly what I want and I'm going to do everything that I've wanted to do. It was like the Eurovision Song Contest and yeah. he loves yeah. Eurovision and I felt like there was this amazing dance routine and they were all a little bit out of time <laughs> and one of them kicked her shoe off and it was it was such a wonderful thing to see and this Vogue thing was amazing. Like that really, was fantastic. The raw, Who was your favourite Vogue editor? Um, I really like Grace and I really like Susie. Yeah, Susie. I like Susie because <laughs> Susie, Susie was the best. Because the Susie was taking a picture yeah. of, of her, Susie. Yeah, sure. I thought that was fantastic <laughs> and was clapping above her head which I just loved and I liked that I liked how joyous it made everybody yeah. like yeah. and I loved I actually loved this footballer's wife section like I, it, it just felt like it, it wasn't was sad at all no not, yeah. at, all. Yeah. not at all really, that's what really I said when you said you know was it a failure it was not a failure yeah, exactly. I mean it's just yeah. like a, the guys have done and he it. was he was like for so many, many years the absolute benchmark I mean the greatest yeah. The, 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 the level that he sustained mm. yeah. the collections and the performance at for years and years was, I mean, unprecedented. But um, is there not a sadness to someone who, as you say, is so incredible and so skilled and has affected fashion in so many ways, saying, I can't operate within this system anymore? No, I think he seals the memory like, mm. by doing this. I, yeah. think, I think there's not, there's no sort of lingering. I mean, I think there was an element of lingering which he quickly put a stop no, to but not sadness for him but sadness for the system in general when someone that creative and that brilliant cannot operate within it well I think the fashion landscape's kind of changed and the we'll thing I think really interesting is we, you talk about Gaultier and I even you know when people say on front cerebral and things Gaultier's been going a year less than Armani yeah that's the really that's something that I find when I realised that I was like I can't believe he's been going so yeah. long and it's you know actually I didn't know it's amazing yeah, it, that's re I found that really incredible you don't think and of you them feel that Armani's been there forever yeah and Gautier started yesterday I mean yeah. because of the exactly that's what it feels but creations and I mean it's, it's funny you're talking about um, it kind of brings it back to Galliano in a way because you know time moves on and, and we get we get so caught up in moments mm. that, that we just think oh this is going to last forever or, or yeah. and it seems like it seems like such a brutal truncation that Gautier is you know closing down as ready to wear even if it is on his terms but but you know things change and mm. that's one thing i would say about john that the cult of designer has changed yeah. so yeah. much in, in the last 10 years and what john represented at at his peak no longer exists yep. as an ideal. Completely. Now the cult of designer is attached to people like Phoebe, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that is, it's going to be very, very interesting to see how he personally yeah. adjusts to that yeah. shift. Because and I feel like this he's not, you know, the photo of him that was released with the announcement is, well, the cat, is it the cat, a cat? Yeah, oh, it's that? the dog. Yeah. A dog. It's, um, it, it, it just, felt out of time to me. It didn't mm. feel I'd like to have seen him, you know, shaggy and a bit more real. Yeah, a bit more real. Yeah. I think and almost it's that weird thing where we talk <coughs> about Margiela, but it's almost like the that cult of designer has changed so you don't need Margiela to be the way Margiela you don't need him to be so reticent and absent in a way because mm. it's changed. You don't have those superstar designers that you need someone to represent the alternative anymore. Mm. Mm. So maybe actually that's why talking about John as and Margiela has been these different designers, really, at the moment, we're in between those two. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm becoming a bit nostalgic, because I actually always loved the idea of a designer superstar. I think this was the season, though, thinking about the appointments that mm. we've discussed, but you really saw that, mm. um, it's a collection we haven't talked about, with something like Sonia Rico, where it's not a kind of a star face mm. appointment. And she did an amazing job. Yeah, oh, that was a standout yeah, collection. Was great. Yeah. 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 And, and then so we really started with Christophe Lemaire again, you know, yeah. then... Uh, um, it is the kind of the quiet designer, is the mm. 
but but then I guess way. next time we do this, we'll we'll be coming back to the idea of what is real, like trying to define this. You know, what is real? What yeah. is real anymore? What uh, in anything? What is real anymore? The the world is. I mean, I would say surreal now. Thinking of what happens on the news with. I was watching the news uh, while we were, I think while we were in Paris one night in the 21st century mm. and the first item is a beheading and the second, second item is Scotland seceding. It could have been news from the 12th century. Mm. Mm. You know, this weird, I think we're living in a very, yeah, you said flux. Flux. Maybe that's a good note to a end on. Flux. We're living in a time of flux and everything is odd. And we love that. And we love that, oh, yeah. as we should. Well, should we give all the wonderful designers in Paris a round of applause to, to wrap things up? Thank you.